If you'd like this morning, we do have some message notes that Delbert can bring to you. I probably don't have enough for everybody, but uh, if you want to kind of follow along, take something home in your Bible, just raise your hand and he'll, he'll track you down. Um, just a question, okay? The video that I showed, if I talk that fast all the time, would that be okay? No? Okay. Did you, you had trouble keeping up with that? Is that what I'm hearing? I'm so sorry. But, uh, you know, I just, when I found that video, I thought, man, what a great introduction uh, for today's message, as well as just this whole topic of suffering and God being good and all that, which we've looked at uh, a couple of times. So um, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed that. If you want to watch it again, I can get that to you. And uh, you can, you know, play it on a slower speed if you want, maybe to catch more or just watch it more times. I don't know. We are in the final two weeks of our series of messages going through. Uh, the Old Testament book of Job, where we've been looking at some, not all, but some of the conversations that are recorded in that book. And let me, let me just say this. It seems to me like this summer has gone very fast. Does it seem that way to anybody else? Uh, It just seems like it has flown by. In fact, last Friday was the first day of school in Rochester. And what that means is I get to drive the school bus again. And uh, man, it was great um, because there were some kids that I hadn't seen all of last year because they stayed home and did remote uh, during the pandemic. And then there were just some new kids that I'd never met before. Uh, they got on the bus. And I, I think my favorite story uh, of Friday was this. this, this little kid gets on the bus and I'm pulling into the intermediate school to drop off the fourth, fifth and sixth graders. And he goes, is this where I get off? I said, I don't know, honey. I, I how, what's, what grade are you going to be in? He goes, I don't know. <laughs> I said, I don't think this is your school, okay? Uh, you just stay in your seat for a few minutes. I had some paperwork that showed me he was a new kindergartner, okay? Uh, so he, he still had a long ways to go on that uh, bus, bus route. You know, also what was pretty cute about Friday was all the parents taking pictures of their kids, okay? Uh, with little signs that says, you know, fifth grade, sixth grade, whatever. The best part, though, okay, was the parents taking pictures of the teenagers, okay? And the kids just going, let me get on the bus, mom. Let me get on the bus. It's like, nope, we got to get this picture. And, um, you, know, I, I, you know, I think it was okay. Nobody died in the process. Also, one other story. Uh, this, this, this little new kindergartner, okay, uh, has a very long driveway. I mean, we're talking maybe a little longer than a, maybe a tenth of a mile or whatever. She was ready to go to school. So as soon as she saw the bus pulling up, she takes off running for the school bus. And I look up, and here comes mom running behind her with her backpack going, Honey, wait, wait, you're, you're going to need this. And, um, you know, it, it was just It was great. I I really do think the kids are excited, uh, for the most part, about getting back to school. Uh, Maybe not the learning part, uh, but at least being able to see their friends and uh, even be in in person with their teachers. So I I don't know if they had as much fun as I did on Friday. Uh, The worst part is getting up at 4.30. Um, But you know what? It's still great to see the kids. You know, it's also fun uh, to wrap up a message series that I hope We've learned some things about Job that maybe we didn't know before, and maybe in the process, even a couple of things about God. Like I said, throughout the series, we've been looking at different conversations. We looked at the conversation between God and Satan. We looked at the conversation between Job and his wife. We looked at some conversations between Job and three friends who showed up to comfort him, they said, but really just ended up being an irritation to Job more than anything, because all they wanted to do was to place blame on him for all the things that were happening in his life. Last week, we looked at a a conversation of a fourth friend, actually, it was more of a monologue, uh, where a guy named Elihu, he'd been listening for a while to the other conversations with the other three friends. We don't know how long, but he kept his mouth shut because he was younger. But when he couldn't hold it in anymore, and the three friends were done with their conversation with Job, he just unloads, did he not? He unloads on Job, he unloads on the three friends, he lets them have it, okay? But what we see, I think, is that he wasn't totally off base. In fact, we're going to see some things today that I think say that maybe he was on the right track with a few things that he had to say. Today, we're going to look at the conversation between God and and Job, okay? Again, to use the term conversation might be stretching a little bit (laughs) because Job didn't say a whole lot, okay? He was kind of at a loss for words. But God made sure 
that he came through loud and clear. And, and what I want to do is I want to look at this conversation between Job and God through the lens of prayer. Can we look at this conversation through the lens of prayer? Because if you think about it, as a child of faith, we're taught that prayer is what? Prayer is a conversation with God. Prayer is talking with God. Unlike how we pray when we get older, where we talk a lot during our prayers and we don't let God say a whole lot, Job experienced just the opposite. God talked a lot and Job didn't say very much. What happened to Job made me think about what would our response be if we had the same thing happen to us that happened to Job in chapter 38, verse 1. It says this in the NIV, the Lord answered Job out of the storm. The Lord answered Job out of the storm. Now, I don't know about you, but when I pray, I see God as a heavenly father, not as a raging storm. It's much easier for me to talk to a heavenly father figure than it would be to talk to a raging storm. But you know what? God didn't show up for Job in some meek and mild form. He showed up. And a whirlwind is actually the word that's used there. And it's the same idea, the same word group that's used in chapter 1 that talks about the wind that blew down the houses that killed Job's kids. So we're not talking about some little gust of wind that blows up a little dust here. We're talking about a raging storm. Maybe an F4 or an F5 if you wanted to use the Fujita scale to measure tornadoes, Okay. We're talking about a storm that God speaks to Job through. Back in 2004, Hurricane Charlie hit Florida and the southeast coast. And most of the billboards and signs that were in the path of this 100 plus mile an hour storm were just obliterated. However, I'm told that there was one billboard that resisted the high winds. And while the billboard still stood, the advertisement that was on that billboard at the time was peeled back and revealed another message that had been there before that latest message had been put on. You know what the message was that was revealed that had been there before? We need to talk, God. We need to talk. You know, that was the message that Job had been saying to God, but it just didn't seem like God was hearing him. But there's no question that God heard everything that Job was saying. And you know what? We need to remember this, that even when God doesn't answer our prayers in the manner or the time frame that we want him to, he still hears our prayers. And because he hears us, there's a couple of things that I want to just pull out of this conversation between Job and God this morning that I think it might be good if we kept in mind as we prayed with God. The first is this. Be careful what you ask for. We need to be careful what we ask for. I'm not talking about there are things that are off limits or things that we shouldn't ask God for. Because... I. I think Jesus said, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find and knock and the door will be open for you. I don't think God is offended when we say things to him or ask him for certain things. Because we've got to believe that he's only going to give us what's in our best interest, don't we? I mean, we've got to believe that. And what God wants is he wants us to be this transparent child when we pray. But you know what? As we get older, we might want to be careful what we ask God for. Because you know what? We may not know exactly what we're asking for. Let's look back at some of Job's requests. Can we do that? There's a lot of them here, okay? I'm going to pull a lot of scriptures. That if you've got the notes, they're all listed there. You can go back and read them again later. But just listen to some of the things that Job asked God for or said to God. Chapter 7, verse 11. I can't keep from speaking, Job says. I must express my anguish. My bitter soul must complain. 
If I have sinned, what have I done to you, O watcher of all humanity? Why make me your target? Am I a burden to you? Why not just forgive my sin and take away my guilt? For soon I will lay down and die in the, I will lay down in the dust and die. When you look for me, I'll be gone. Chapter Job, chapter 9, verse 32, Job says, God is not a mortal like me, so I can't argue with him or take him to trial. If only there were a mediator between us, someone who could bring us together. The mediator could make God stop uh, beating me, and I would no longer live in terror of his punishment. Then I could speak to him without fear, but I can't do that on my own strength. Jump to Job chapter 10, verse 2. I will say to God, don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge you are bringing against me. Although you know I am not guilty, no one can rescue me from your hands. You formed me with your hands. You made me. You know, you, now you completely destroy me. Remember that you made me from dust. Will you turn me back to dust so soon? Chapter 13, verse 3. As for me, I will speak directly to the Almighty. I want to argue my case with God himself. Verse 15. God might kill me, but I have no other hope. I'm going to argue my case with him. But this is what will save me. I'm not godless. If I were, I couldn't stand before him. Jump down to verse 20. Oh, God, grant me these two things, and then I will be able to face you. Remove your heavy hand from me, and don't terrify me with your awesome presence. Now summon me, and I will answer, or let me speak to you, and you reply. Tell me, what have I done wrong? Show me my rebellion and my sin. A couple more, chapter 23, verse 3. If only I knew where to find God, I would go to his court. I would lay out my case and present my arguments. Then I would listen to his reply and understand what he says to me. Would he use his great power to argue with me? Nah. He would give me a fair hearing. Honest people could reason with him. So I would be forever acquitted by my judge. Get the feel here of Job just being kind of honest, isn't he? Chapter 31. If only someone would listen to me. Look, I will sign my name to my defense. Let the Almighty answer me. Let my accuser write out the charges against me. <clears throat> I would face the accusation proudly. I would wear it like a crown. For I would tell him exactly what I have done. I would come before him like a prince. That's a lot conversation with God, is it not, on Job's part? Job was suffering, and he was really tired of only hearing silence from God, so he makes some pretty bold statements. He was being transparent as a child. He was being honest, and he was just trying to make his case before God. He, he said, God, would you just listen to me? Well, he was. He asked God to defend his innocence. Keep in mind, only a few people knew that Job was actually innocent. God, Satan, all the heavenly beings, and Job himself, they knew he was innocent. So Job was saying, God, please help me out with this. Job wanted to see God. Job wanted to reason with God. You know, nothing that Job asked for, I think, was unreasonable. My guess is if I were Job or you were Job, you probably would have asked for the same types of things that he did. But we have to keep in mind is that when we ask these things of God, God hears us and we need to be prepared for his answer. And let's face it, most of the time his answer isn't going to be what we ask for. And depending, and depending on how and what we ask for, we may get something we don't expect. That's what happened to Job. He said, I want to see God. He wanted to stand before God, plead his case, because he knew that God was going to do whatever he wanted to do. But I don't think Job realized how much of a schooling he was going to get from God when he asked for what he did. 
Which leads to the second thing we need to keep in mind when we pray, and that is we need to be prepared to learn something we don't know, especially about God. When we pray, we need to be prepared to learn something we don't know. This goes along with what we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, about God's greatness and his power. <coughs> but if we know, <coughs> going into our conversation with God, that he is in fact not bound by any box that we put him in, we're not going to limit him by what we ask for or what we ask him to do for us. That makes such a huge difference in how we pray. It kind of goes along with what, with, with what Rick Warren alluded to that we said a couple weeks ago, which was, do we really want a God who is limited to the only options we give him? Do we really want a God who's only limited to our options that we ask him for? When God answer, answered Job's request, he got a little more than he was asking for. In fact, here's God's first words to Job. Chapter 38, verse 2. Who is this? that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words. <clears throat> Brace yourself <clears throat> like a man, <clears throat> because I have some questions for you, Job, and you must answer them. Anybody here like pop quizzes when you were in school? I hated those things. You know, it's when you walk into class and the student says, okay, put away your books. Nowadays, it, I guess it would be Chromebooks. And, uh, you know, they would say, you know, take out a piece of paper and I'm going to ask you some questions and you're going to write down your answers. It, it seemed to me like the teachers only did that on the mornings after I hadn't done the homework the night before. And there were many, many times where I just made up an answer, <laughs> I'll be honest, or I just couldn't write anything down. And my only hope was they would grade on a curve and the smart people in the class hadn't done their homework either. But um, <clears throat> I still passed high somehow, so it wasn't all bad. Uh, but you know what? Um, yesterday, we were on a board training day at Loving Arms Pregnancy Center, and we had a consultant who gave us a pop quiz during this training. Everybody flunked but Kathy. Okay? I think it's because she cheated. I think it's because she knew the question ahead of time, so she, you know, she, she got the right answer, but the rest of us were just humbled, if you want to put it that way. God didn't just give Job a pop quiz. He gave him an examination that the smartest doctoral student wouldn't have been able to answer if he had been asked these questions. And that was really God's point. God's point to Job was, I, I, I'm going to ask you some questions that you don't know the answer to. Because you're going to get my point. The first series of questions that God asked Job primarily had to do with creation and the universe that Job had no way of knowing the answers to. For example, in chapter 38, let's, let's look at some of the questions. See if you know the answers to these. 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundation, and who laid its cornerstone? As the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. Pretty cool picture of creation there, isn't it? Verse 12. Have you commanded the morning to appear and cause the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness? Verse 16. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you know where the gates of death are located? Have you seen the gates of utter gloom? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it if you know. Where does light come from? And where does darkness go? Verse 31. Can you direct the movement of the stars, Job? Binding the cluster of the Pleiades or loosening the cords of Orion? Can you direct the constellations through the seasons or guide the bear with her cubs across the heavens? Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? Can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? That's what thunder is, I'm guessing. 
At the end of chapter 38 and then through chapter 39, he, God shifts his questioning a little bit to talk more about animals. And this had to kind of sting a little bit to Job because keep in mind, he had a lot of livestock. He had a lot of working animals and he didn't know the answer to these questions either. Chapter 39, verse 1, God says, <clears throat> do you know when the wild goats give birth? Had you watched as deer are born in the wild? Verse 9, will the ox consent to being tamed? Will it spend the night in your stall? Can you hitch a wild ox to a plow? Will it plow a field for you? Verse 26. Is it your wisdom, Job, that makes the hawk soar and spread its wings towards the south? Is it at your command that the eagles rise to the heights to make its nest? Can you imagine being Job <laughs> and the moment it hits you? I am so far in over my head right now, I don't have a clue. For me, that would have been the point where I heard God's voice coming through this raging storm, okay? That would have been enough to get my attention. But to have to sit there or stand there before God and have him drill me with question after question after question that shows I don't know Jack. But he does. Chapter 40, God takes a breath, and I think he wants to make sure that Job's on the right track, okay? Look at what he says in cha er, chapter 40, verse 2. God says to Job, do you still want to argue with the Almighty? You are God's critic, but do you have the answers? We'll look at Job's response in a minute, but in chapters 40 and 41, God continues to make it crystal clear to Job that there are just some things that he doesn't understand, and he's going to have to be okay with that. Now, there are some scholars and there are some people that God was trying to belittle or to humiliate Job here. I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think God operates that way. I think he was just trying to make the point very clear to Job. Job, I'm God and you're not. To make his point, God reveals a part of himself that Job had never seen before. You know, when we're conscious of God's greatness and power, we're going to be a little more careful in how we pray, aren't we? I like the story that Tim Keller tells about how one of his Sunday school teachers back in 1970 changed his life with a very simple illustration that had stuck with him throughout his lifetime about how big and powerful God is. I share with you. The teacher said, let's assume that the distance between the earth and the sun, which is 92 million miles, was reduced to the thickness of a sheet of paper. Hold that sheet of paper up if you've got the notes. If that's the case, then the distance between the earth and the nearest star would be a stack of paper 70 feet high. The width of our galaxy would be papers stacked 310 miles high. And Keller's teacher said this. That galaxy is just a speck of dust in the universe. Yet Jesus holds the universe together by the word of his power. That revelation, I think, is similar to what Job experienced in his conversation with God. He's big enough that when we pray for something... And God answers our prayers. We're going to learn something about God. If we're listening. If we're willing to learn. <coughs> Which leads to the third thing. That I would encourage us to keep in mind. When we have a very serious conversation with God. And that is in some way we're going to be humbled. We're going to be humbled in some way. When we truly have a conversation with God. In fact, at some point, we have to acknowledge that God, who God is when he answers our prayers. And in doing so, we're going to experience a little bit about what Job did. Job chapter 40, verse 3. When God took a breath, Job said, I am nothing. How could I ever find the answers? I'm just going to cover my mouth and my hand, with my hand. I've said too much already. 
I have nothing more to say. Those were Job's words as God was driving home his point. God did so more in chapters 40 and 41. So in 42, this is what Job said. I know that you can do anything. And no one can stop you. You ask, who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I love this line. Job says, I'd only heard about you before. But now I've seen you with my own eyes. I, I take back everything I said, God. And I'm just going to sit here in the dust and ashes and show my repentance. Job was humbled. And the same thing happens to us every time we see God. We are humbled and we repent. I love how he says, I've only heard about you before now, God, but now I see you. Every time we see God, we are going to be humbled. There's just no other way around it. And when he answers our prayers and reveals himself to us in some fresh new way, some way that we haven't seen before, we're going to want to sit in dust and ashes, either figuratively or literally, just like Job. So I ask you, what if our prayer life, our conversations with God, were like Job's? What if we were careful about what we ask for? What if we were willing to learn something new about God every time we talked with him? And what if every time we prayed, we were humbled in some way? What if we took that approach instead of just telling God, hey, God, I need you to do this, 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 and this. I'd like for you to do it this way if at all possible. My guess is if we adopted that style of prayer in our lives, our lives would be transformed in ways that we can't even begin to imagine. Reality is that oftentimes it will take suffering and really big challenges in our life to get us on our knees and pray in that way. I don't think that's how God wants to communicate with us. He loves us so much that he wants that relationship to improve so that he, so he allows those things. He brings things into our lives that will cause us to get to the point where we just lay in the ashes and say, God, I don't know. As I close, I really hope our prayers echo Job's in at least one way. And that is that we would pray that we want to see God. Jesus said this. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will, what? See God. I only pray that I will have the wisdom of Job. To learn from my conversations with God... So that I will be pure in heart and see God. Let's worship.